I'm a member of the task force to catalyze climate action here at the World Bank, and I'll be guiding you through the session. So before the break, you know, we heard a lot about the impact of agriculture on climate. We also heard a little bit from Jürgen about how all of this fits into a context of climate smart agriculture, which very importantly includes productivity and building resilience and varies from in their priorities from context to context. Um, so in this session, we're going to try to see, and we also, sorry, we also heard a little bit from research about how agriculture might become part of the solution to climate. So we're going to try to talk about these things. In particular, we're going to try to identify practical steps and potential financial instruments for realizing agriculture's potential to become part of the solution. Um, I think we have a pretty exciting array of speakers uh, for you today, and um, they come in two groups. Uh, we first have a group of practitioners that uh, are involved in projects in Costa Rica, in West Africa, and in Brazil, and are going to tell us about uh, the innovative work that each of them and their organizations are doing. And we're the, then going to try to complement them uh, with three representatives of organizations that finance projects, such as the World Bank, uh, to get a, try to get a better sense of, of how we can get these projects funded. So at the end, uh, I hope we'll have ample time for discussion. We're a little bit behind schedule, but I hope we'll have at least half an hour. Um, presentations this time are shorter. They're 10 minutes each. So let's get started. Our first speaker today is Giovanna Valverde. Giovanna is a senior advisor and director of foreign affairs at the Ministry of Agriculture of Costa Rica. She leads uh, Costa Rica's work at the international level in, on many fronts. And she's also closely involved with the development of uh, agriculture sector NAMAS, which are weird animals uh, also called national appropriate mitigation actions. So I'm hoping she will tell us something about that. Giovanna. Thank you so much, Tobias. Good morning to everyone and to our colleagues from CCAPS. Thank you so much for this invitation and uh, World Bank and colleagues from the Biocarbon Fund. Um, I wanted to share with you um, Costa Rica zero emission policy and what we're doing in agriculture for the livestock and coffee namas. Um, I'm going to begin with the policy aspect of what we have done. First, I think it's important to state that Costa Rica, back in 2007, decided to become a carbon neutral country. So that was, let's say, our guideline in terms of national uh, policy that we had, we have the National Strategy for Climate Change. Um, and within that framework, the agriculture and livestock sector, back in 2010, we sat down and wrote the public policy for the sector for the next 11 years. And within that, we have um, the four pillars, of which one of them is specifically for the um, agricultural or ag agro-environmental agenda and climate change. Um, but I also wanted to point out here that within the national framework, we, we have been pushing to create this National Carbon Committee, and last month it was finally instated, and we are developing the domestic voluntary carbon market. So that's also kind of a driving force, um, particularly for the private sector, to focus on, on mitigation. <clears throat> in terms of the state policy uh, that I mentioned that we elaborated back in 2010, we have focused on these four pillars. This, this has been what, what we are working on, and um, public sector, private sector, NGOs, academia, they know that this is what our goals or our focus are. And the fourth pillar is the one that um, has brought us into the world of adaptation, mitigation, and vulnerability, vulnerability and risk management. <clears throat> And I mention these three because I think, as some of the speakers mentioned before, sometimes you start talking about mitigation and you go down that, that path and you kind of forget the rest of it. But for our country, even though it is a mandate to become carbon neutral, and we know agriculture is a key player because it represents 38% of the emissions, adaptation is just as important. And uh, what we've tried to do is find the synergies between adaptation and mitigation. Um, because otherwise, for the farmers, it just doesn't make any sense at all. 
So why is the agricultural sector so important? Well, it represents, it says 37, but really it's 37.9, so 38% of the uh, country's overall emissions. Energy and transportation, 46%. Waste, 11%. Industry, 6%. Um, and as you can see, when you break that down into nitrous oxide and methane, in both cases, livestock is the largest emitter. Costa, uh, in Costa Rica's livestock sector accounts for 82% of the total agricultural sector emissions. And here you see a uh, breakdown specifically per sub-products. And that's why we focused, um, we began with coffee because it represented, back taking our national inventory from 2005, we thought that coffee's um, um, nitrous oxide emissions were about 24%, so we, that's why we focused on the NAMA for the coffee sector. And then we had the livestock um, emissions, which accounted for about 40% in total of the sector. But, um, and I think that's why it was very important, Dr. Clark's presentation on the tier one, tier two, emissions, and that is that each country should really start working and focusing on, on uh, creating their own um, measurements and, and, and because the emission factors are really, really not so realistic for most countries. So we began with the livestock NAMA exactly one, one year and two, three months ago. And the reason for this was um, the importance not only in terms of, as I mentioned, the emissions, that they represent 82% of the total agricultural and livestock sector emissions, but also in terms of, um, as you can see, we have 45,000 farms and they occupy 1.8 million hectares. My country is 5.2 million hectares, so that represents 35% of the total national land um, sector. That's why it is so important. Um, it is also very important because on the majority of these farms, we already have live fences, um, some silvopastoral arrangements, and so it's here that we feel that there's the greatest potential um, for carbon sequestration and in terms of the whole NAMA uh, project. Um, live, livestock contributes to 1.5% of GDP and 14% of the Costa Rican labor force is in this sector. The NAMA concept, basically, we took um, the private sector made the first survey in 25 years last year. So now we have a clear idea of what we have in terms of the distribution of beef sectors, about 34%, dairy 21%, dual purpose 38%. And that's important because each one of these categories will have different approaches. It's not the same to reduce emissions uh, for a cow that's grazing, you know, one cow per hectare versus if you have a dairy production where you have perhaps, you know, they're a little bit more crowded, perhaps you're already very efficient, so you have to find other ways to, to reduce your emissions in terms of, um, of um, nitrogenated fertilizers, for example. Very quickly, these are the four actions that we're going to be implementing in the NAMA for the livestock sector, and they're completely in line with what, what Dr. Clark mentioned. Um, in terms of the grazing uh, cattle, we're talking about improvement of pastures, uh, rotational grazing, and this is a, a system that was developed by a, a French um, chemist called Monsieur Boisson, who ended up living in Cuba, um, died about 30 years ago. But this whole rotational approach means if every two days you make your cows move, you're not going to compact the soil as much. Um, the pastures are going to grow faster. So when the animal gets back to that particular part of the farm, it'll have better feed. It means if it has better feed, it's also going to um, emit less. You're also going to have more roots in the soil. Obviously, you have to, together with the rotation, the ideal um, mix is improvement of pastures. And in that regard, um, that's what we're working on. And, each area of the country is going to be different because if you have a really um, tropical area, you might need a brachiaria. If you're in the dry area, you might need something else. So that's the work that we're doing right now is deciding what are the ideal pastures according to the different types of zones in the country. The silvopastoral systems, 
And finally, the improved fertilization, and that's more specific for the dairy sector. So these are the four specific actions that we're going to be implementing. We're starting with 100 pilot farms, and the objective is to reach 80% of all the, the livestock farmers in the country. Um, by the year, we hope, 2021, we're working on that. And I think it's also important to mention uh, at the very bottom here, it talks about manure management and genetics, which we're obviously considering, but um, we feel that the manure management percentage of emissions is really low for the time being, so we're not going to really get into that. Eventually we will, and genetics, of course, but that requires a lot more investment. It's a, you know, a lot more complicated story. So this is just so you get an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about a livestock NAMA. Um, I think it's also important to note that this is a, a work, a, how could I explain, a, a marriage between the public sector and the private sector because without them this could not possibly happen. And in fact, they're the ones who have to believe in this because this is not about the government saying, you got it, you have to make a NAMA. No, it's them. And they believe in it. We've been working together for a year. And um, we've worked with all the chambers, with the federations, with the uh, communities. So we really started with a bottom to top approach. And it's been very, very effective. People believe in it. And here, Dr. Reddy can uh, testify to that because I took him to visit some of the farms and see what was happening in that regard. And the, the best thing is that it's the private sector and the farmers that believe in what they're doing. Um, just really quickly, and these of course are rough estimates, um, but what we consider is the potential of mitigation. And um, as you can see, you have the GHG reduction, about 1.2 million tons. Here we're talking about a 15 year period um, and assuming 80% of the total farms in the country. And as you can see, the significant number there is the carbon capture. Um, and that is taking into account the live fences that are there and in, in planting more trees within those live fences, um, increasing the civil pastoral arrangements and, um, and the carbon sinks in the, because of the change in pastures and, and, and in soils. What we did not include, and this is important because it's been mentioned a couple of times, is the double accounting. And some of you may know that Costa Rica has been very active in red and now in red plus. Uh, we started the payment for environmental services 20 years ago. And uh, a lot of these farms already have some kind of perhaps payment for environmental service. So since Costa Rica um, was almost 30% no, almost 70% deforested back in the 70s. And now we've gone up to 52.2 of forest um, coverage in the country. Our situation is very different than other countries. So really, we, we can't go any further there. So the only place we can go to have forest coverage is in the livestock area, because that's a third of the country. And so what we're trying to do now is work with FONAFIFA, which is the National Forestry Fund, um, to A, avoid the double accounting, and B, work together so that just as they created this wonderful scheme 20 years ago of the uh, payment for environmental services, that we create something similar but for the livestock sector. Um, so that's kind of, kind of where we're heading right now. And this is just really quickly because it's what we're, we've started to do with the private sector. So we created now these four different groups five actually, uh, the regional committees that are eight different regions of the country, and you have um, the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, um, and the private sector corporation uh, livestock people. We created a scientific group, so there you have the Academia, Katie, uh, Inta, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have a round table that now we've started getting them going, and it's more private sector driven so that they can bring their um, questions or what, how can we move forward discussions at the table. And the highest one, which is more like the, I don't know, the CEO of the largest dairy company, the CEO of um, the livestock corporation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what we started with this, with this year. In terms of the Nama coffee um, and value chain, this one we started two years ago. And uh, <clears throat> 
50,000 producers, but on average they have less than two hectares per person. Uh, so it's very small oriented kind of production. Uh, what's interesting about the, the coffee producers are in Costa Rica, and, and we're talking about the total, 100% of them is 50,000 farmers, is that they all belong to co-ops. So it's a lot easier to do the work, and you can bring them all together. And there the approach was top to bottom versus bottom to top. Um, and I think one of the challenges now is getting that to the bottom, bottom, bottom. Um, but at the top level, everybody knows about it, they believe in it, and uh, the main changes that we're talking about there are the same, the agroforestry systems, and we already created a new fund that's called the, um, the Coffee Silver Pass um, Agroforestry System, same as the Payment for Environmental Services, but it's specifically for coffee, and they receive $50 per year to plant 70 trees per hectare, of which half of them have to be um, indigenous, indigenous species. Um, and so that's started to work very well. Um, in the coffee mills, we've already got, have about half of them that have started with these new technologies, which are things like using the coffee husk as um, combustion to dry the coffee. Uh, now the next stage is using the pulp, which has a lot of residues, and when you wash it out, you have these oxida oxidation lakes, which emit methane. So we're working on finding better ways to deal with those pools. And one of them, and you'll see in the next slide, is, is um, spraying it on the fields. And that seems to work, but it still needs work because it depends on the type of um, grass that you have in the soil. So some, some kinds of grass have long, deep roots, can absorb the water better, uh, others cannot. Uh, new efficient practices with fertilizers, such as niproxen. Um, and in some of the co-ops, they've already started with um, wind farms, which has also been very, very successful. The ones that are currently under development, um, like I mentioned, the uh, or gasification or bioenergy using the coffee husk and coffee pulp. And I was going to bring two videos, but since I was told I could only be here for 10 minutes, I didn't bring them, but they were really wonderful. If you're interested, I I'll tell you more about them. Um, so this is one thing that the Coffee Institute is working on, is trying to perfect this concept of the gasification so that you can use it not only as um, to dry the coffee beans, but also to create electricity. And maybe, Dr. Clark, we can talk about that because that's a scientific big problem we have there. Um, and the organic residues, as I mentioned, we're, we're starting to do this of the spraying into the fields, and that seems to be working quite well. Uh, expected outcomes of the coffee nama Eco-competitiveness, uh, finding better markets, uh, resilience for 50,000 families because we're helping them to change their, their, the, the coffee varieties they have now because I don't know if you've heard, but the past two years have been catastrophic for the coffee production in Central America with the rust. It's a type of fungi that attacks the leaves. It's been there for at least 40 years, but because of the higher temperatures, higher humidity, they grow much faster and they've been very uh, aggressive and destroyed 60 or attacked 60% of all the coffee production in Costa Rica, of which 30% had to be cut down completely and started from scratch. So the point is now we have, and we had been preparing to do this change, except it was the rust that made us be more, move quickly to have these uh, more resistant varieties of coffee. So here you have an example of how you can have um, an action that will meet both adaptation and mitigation. Um, so I think this is a very good example of how you can do both. And, and in livestock, it's exactly the same thing. With the pastures, improved pastures, you have benefits in adaptation for drier times, and you have mitigation because of what I explained already. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show this because we have been working with CCAFs on this report um, for the past three or four months and they finally published it, I think, a week ago, and it's in Spanish, but, um, but there's some very interesting information, so I wanted to thank CCAPS for the work we've done together, um, our friends from the World Bank and Biocarbon Fund, and um, if any of you are interested, I have, because I didn't want to bring too much weight, I brought the nice, wonderful bookmarkers, and here is the website of the Ministry of Agriculture with all the documents and videos that we have made about climate change in the past three years. 
English and Spanish, so I think that could be useful for, or interesting to some of you. And also I brought this um, short um, concept paper um, that I took to the negotiations and which we presented um, in Warsaw in the, I don't know if you all know what the NAMA facility is, but it's like a fund with funds from the German government and from the UK government and they chose 47 countries or projects that have to do with mitigation and Costa Rica was awarded the resources for the NAMA coffee. But we presented the livestock one as well. It's just that it's a lot more complicated. So we're going to try again and again and again. But um, if anybody wants to see it, uh, I'd be more than happy. I brought like 10 copies of this. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much.